begin by making sure that we're on the same page regarding the title of this address. My subject is not the universal one of classics anytime, anywhere, but rather that which comes to us from Greek and Roman antiquity. When I speak of teaching a classical text, I am talking about a pagan text that arises from a non-Christian religious context. For purposes of illustration, I will take excursions into Homer's epic, The Odyssey, but I want to make sure that I provide a general framework within which to teach any text that comes to us from the distant past and is based on a religious and moral vision that exists without input from the Bible or the Christian faith. My overarching thesis is that we need to give credit where credit is due, while at the same time criticism, criticizing where criticism is required. My talk will be partly theoretic and partly pedagogical, and in both cases with an eye on what in our circles we call integration. Let me begin with some literary theory that I apply to every work of literature that I teach, but that is perhaps especially relevant when we teach what I call a pagan text, that is a text that comes to us from antiquity and from a non-Christian context. C.S. Lewis was of the opinion that the first requirement when we read a work of literature or stand before a painting or listen to a piece of music is an act of surrender, an act of surrender. This is expressed in a famous essay entitled How the Few and the Many Use Pictures and Music. Lewis writes that, quote, the first demand any work of art makes upon us is surrender. Look, listen, receive, get yourself out of the way. Elizabeth Good is on the same page when she writes that self-forgetfulness is one of the rewards of, te of reading and by extension experiences in the sister arts. Self-forgetfulness. But assimilation of works of art is a two-stage process. After we have been self-forgetful, we need to be self-conscious about our identity as Christians. From the beginning of my teaching career, I have accepted T.S. Eliot's theory that after we have allowed a work of art to be itself, we need to complete the two-stage process with something else. Here is his famous formulation from an essay entitled Religion and Literature. Literary criticism should be completed by criticism from a definite ethical and theological standpoint. It is necessary for Christian readers to scrutinize their reading, especially of works of imagination, with explicit ethical and theological standards. Here is how the framework I have just shared works itself out when I teach the Odyssey. My main approach is to stress the work as a narrative and within that as an epic. Right at the outset, I say to my students that to tell a story is to A, entertain, and B, make a statement. To entertain, to make a statement. I believe that the second of these, the thematic content of a work like the Odyssey, needs to enter the discussion relatively late. The first thing is to experience the narrative qualities of the work and not worry unduly about questions of moral vision and worldview until we have assimilated the text that embodies those things. As you doubtless know, this formalist approach is decidedly old-fashioned. But I will note in passing that in Beowulf, old swords are considered better than new ones. A lot of my career is encapsulated in that formula. Old swords are better than new ones. Uh, nothing gets more attention in my teaching of the Odyssey than my exploration of Homer's epic as a triumph of storytelling. In fact, two-thirds of the way through my three weeks on the Odyssey, I assign a mini-paper on the Odyssey as a triumph of storytelling. I believe that a literature course should not be a history course or a history of ideas course, though I understand completely that there is a difference between a humanities course and a literature course. In my class sessions devoted to the Odyssey, I march through the story in sequence, telling my students that I will do selectively, as time permits, what every reader needs primarily to do in individual reading of a story, namely, to relive the story as fully as possible. I tell my students the first item on the agenda, and this includes reading something in the Bible, is to relive the text as fully as possible. Another name for this in-class procedure is running commentary on the text, interspersed with analytic frameworks or lenses through which to look at various aspects of the story. In my running commentary, my goal is to make the settings, the characters, and the events come alive in my students' imaginations 
I want my students to relish the suspense, the irony, the careful structure of an episode, the conflicts and their resolution, and other narrative ingredients. In addition to such running commentary, I introduce helpful grids where they are relevant. Here's an example. When I begin book five, I introduce a grid for analyzing and organizing the 12 adventures of Odysseus. In fact, I have a page in my handbook that lists the 12 adventures in the order in which we read them, accompanied by a chart with squares that I want my students to fill in as they read the assignments and that I use as a summary of the successive episodes as I cover them in class. <clears throat> The grid is based on the two premises of variety of adventure and the temptation motif. The categories for variety of adventure are as follows. The length of the episode as measured by the amount of space it gets in the story. The violence or mildness of the adventure. The kind of agent involved in the episode. For example, people, monsters, deities, natural forces. And the setting and atmosphere of each of the 12 adventures. In regard to the temptation motif, the things I want identified are the nature of the sins to which Odysseus and or his men are tempted, to what are they tempted, and the virtues that are required in the face of the temptations. One avenue toward seeing the entertainment value of the Odyssey is to alert my students to the genres that converge in Homer's masterpiece. The Odyssey, for example, is a travel story par excellence, so I take time early in my journey through the poem to delineate the excellencies of travel stories. And here's what I say to my students. Travel stories are abundant in the world because of their virtues as a kind of story. Travel stories provide both adventure and locale, and both are great subject matter for stories. Travel stories invariably involve danger, risk, suspense, and testing. They bring the traveler into encounters with unknown characters and customs. In ancient literature, including the Bible, travel usually brings a traveler into an encounter with God or other supernatural beings. Travel also produces change and growth in character, and physical movement often provides new revelation, perhaps explaining why travel stories are prominent in religious narratives of many traditions. Landscape in travel stories almost always takes on moral and spiritual symbolism so that the traveler progresses through a spiritual and moral and psychological landscape as well as a physical one. I want my students to get excited about the dynamics of travel stories. Subgenres within the larger category of travel story include quest story, pilgrimage story, stories of wandering, stories of flight, stories of exile. As I progress through the story in class, I talk about its affinities to the adventure story, the horror story, and fantasy. I do a lot with archetypes, such as the perilous journey. <clears throat> I wax eloquent with my students. What is more exciting than the perilous journey as story material? The earthly paradise, one of my absolute favorites. The villain, <clears throat> Odysseus as wily lad. I pay tribute <clears throat> to Homer's inventiveness in composing a story that often leaves us asking, however did you think of that? To tell a story is to make a statement as well as to entertain, and I'm ready to address that half of the equation. The Roman author Horace claimed that literature combines what is sweet or delightful with what is useful. Wherein lies the usefulness of a pagan text like Homer's Odyssey? Answering that quickly takes us to the question of truth in literature, and I am always insistent that truth consists of more than ideas. <clears throat> in fact, the forte of literature and the arts is truthfulness to life and human experience. I call it representational truth. So I'm always at pains to draw my students' attention to the recognizable human experiences in literature, including ancient literature. We look not only at a literary text, I tell my students, but also through it to our own experiences in the world. After I complete my running commentary on the 12 adventures of Odysseus, I take time to catalog the familiar experiences that the story has put in front of us during the action. I begin by labeling Odysseus the archetypal tourist. Then I ask, what does Odysseus encounter as he travels away from home? <clears throat> 
The list is as follows. Physical danger, threat of death, rearrangement of travel plans and even of the itinerary, violence, offer of drugs, imprisonment, sexual temptation, the occult, forbidden food and drink, inadequate transportation, lost passport, lost luggage, strange places and customs, personal conflict with fellow travelers, hospitality, homesickness, culture shock, <coughs> Polyphemus' cave, getting lost. In my phrasing of the recognizable human experiences of Odysseus during his adventures, partly in terms of modern versions of those experiences, I have engaged in what I call bridging the gap. We need to do this whenever we teach a work that comes to us from the ancient past, including the Bible. We need to bridge the gap between the ancient text and the modern world. If we don't, the ancient text will appear sealed off from our own experience. What is the usefulness of portraying human experience in such a way that we are led to contemplate it and, and affirm that this is indeed how life is? I think of it as yielding a form of knowledge, and I define it as knowledge in the form of right seeing. You might just want to think about that in terms of literature and art. Knowledge in the form of right seeing. The writer gets us to stare at life, and in the process of that contemplation, we are led to see life accurately. Surely this is a form of knowledge worth having. Additionally, the Victorian enthusiast for classical literature, Matthew Arnold, praised Homer and Sophocles for seeing life, I quote, steadily and whole. And compared to our own era when writers see mainly what is negative in human nature and human experience, I think that Arnold's claim is valid. Looking at life steadily and whole also characterizes the Bible. On purely matter, literary matters, I believe that cl classical literature has much in common with biblical writing, which after all comes from loosely the same era. In my world literature course, I end our unit on classical literature with a mini lecture that reaches closure on our encounter with Greek literature. Here's part of what I say in that lecture. In their literary preferences, the Greeks valued the heroic spirit. The heroes of their epics and tragedies are bigger than life figures whose passions and deeds exceed those of ordinary humanity. The classical tradition is a heroic tradition in contrast to the literature of the past century, which is often anti-heroic. Marxist literary critic Terry Eagleton trashed the entire epic tradition with the comment that, quote, we no longer believe in heroism. I say to my students, true, and look at the kind of culture the human race has produced. I think that there is a sense in which the Bible also belongs to the heroic ages. I agree with Luther's comment on the patriarchs and would in fact extend it to most of the Bible. Luther wrote that the age of the patriarchs was, quote, a right golden age. This is the highest honor of the first world, that there lived in it so many pious, wise, and saintly people. For we should not think that they were the common names of plain and simple people, but they were people of heroic excellence. The heroic figures of Abraham, who entertained God at a meal, and Jacob, who wrestled with God, and David, who killed a giant, and Samson, who killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, and Ruth, ancestress of David and the second David, are all more than ordinary. Entering the heroic world of the Bible elevates us and fires our imaginations in the same way that the stories of Odysseus and Penelope and Oedipus and Antigone do. Lest this heroic spirit make classical literature seem irrelevant to us, I say to my students, let me remind you that the subject of literature is always universal human experience. So my second claim for classical literature is its universality. What human experiences do the classical authors put before us? The same ones that all authors put before us. For example, as the Odyssey unfolds, we are repeatedly put in touch with the familiar aspects of the physical world in which we live. Eating, drinking, sleeping, sunrise, water, land. I love a statement by Tolkien in his essay on fairy stories in which he notes, it was in fairy stories that I first divined the potency of things such as stone and wood and iron 
tree and grass, house and fire, bread and wine. I will just add that we need continuously to show the experiential aspect of literature or our students will not see literature as relevant to them. In my experience, the students who never see the point of literature are the ones who do not see that literature embodies universal human experience and is therefore not remote from daily life. Much of what the human race does is universal and this extends to the production and consumption of works of literature. I tell my students that when they write their midterm paper in, with, in which they look at the Old Testament story of Ruth through the lens of Greek literature, I would be genuinely surprised if they do not find a lot of common ground between the classical tradition and the story of Ruth in regard, for example, to, to the question of what makes a good story. I would be very surprised, I tell my students. And then I add, I think that Homer, Sophocles, and the author of Ruth could have been collegial co-instructors in a workshop on the writing of stories. I said at the outset that I intend to steer a middle course between giving credit where credit is due in regard to pagan classics and in criticizing where criticism is due. The general drift of my remarks thus far has been on the credit side of the ledger, and I'm not finished with it. When we come to the moral vision and worldview of enlightened classicism, we can affirm a great deal before we become critical. My preferred way to get at the worldview of the literature that I teach is the idea that a work of literature presents us with an imagined world that the author offers as a truthful picture of reality. What is omitted from the picture can be as important as what is included. Flannery O'Connor said that, quote, it is from the kind of world that the writer creates, from the kind of character and detail he invests it with, that, that a reader can find, note well, the intellectual meaning of a book. It is from the kind of world that a writer creates that we can find the intellectual meaning of a book. Novelist Joyce Carey is on the same page when he says that, quote, all writers must have to compose any kind of story, some picture of the world, and of what is right and wrong in that world. Carey's formula, what is right and wrong, applies most obviously to the moral vision of a story, while O'Connor's formula yields a world view. Let me begin with the moral vision of the Odyssey, which I believe epitomizes the moral vision of the classical tradition. The moral vision of a work of literature is easy to determine. It consists of the system of virtues and vices. The virtues commended for our approval in the Odyssey include courage, self-control, loyalty to home and spouse and family, prudence, duty, and wisdom. The vices are lack of self-control, self-indulgence, greed, thievery, disrespect of others' rights, violence, forgetfulness of home, and folly. Now, of course, it is in the nature of literature to offer positive models to emulate and negative ones to avoid. This means that the positive virtues commended in the Odyssey are sometimes embodied by negative example, that is, by characters who fail to practice a given virtue. To sum up this point, I make enthusiastic claims for the moral vision of the Odyssey. How can a pagan storyteller possibly have gotten it as right as I have claimed? The answer lies in the Christian doctrine of common grace. Calvin himself is the best starting point, and we can discern three leading threads in his thinking on the subject. First, non-Christian writers are capable of expressing what I call the true, the good, and the beautiful, with the result that, and I quote, Whenever we come upon these matters in secular writers, let that admirable light of truth shining in them teach us that the mind of man, though fallen and perverted from its wholeness, is nevertheless clothed and ornamented with God's excellent gifts. Secondly, and as an extension of the first idea, we can affirm truth wherever we find it. Calvin writes, all truth is from God, and consequently, if wicked men have said anything that is true and just, we ought not to reject it for it has come from God. Thirdly, the Spirit of God is the ultimate source of all that is good in literature, and we can honor God as that source. Calvin writes, for example, if we regard the Spirit of God as the sole fountain of truth, we shall neither reject the truth itself, nor despise it wherever it shall appear, unless we wish to dishonor the Spirit of God. And again, we cannot read the writings of the ancients without great admiration 
But shall we count anything praiseworthy or noble without recognizing at the same time that it comes from God? Now Calvin's comments are rooted in biblical data, and here's just a little of it. In the New Testament, Paul several times quotes with approval from pagan poets, just as he quotes from the Old Testament to prove a point. In Paul's speech in Athens to the Areopagus, for example, Paul quotes the Greek or Stoic poets Cleanthes, Arates, and Epimenides, drawing attention to his quotations by saying at one point, as even some of your poets have said, 1 Corinthians 15.33, bad company ruins good morals, often appears in English translations in quotation marks because it is a quotation from the play Thais by the Greek dramatist Menander. And Titus 1 verse 12 reads, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. It is a quotation from Epimenides, a native of Crete, and Paul immediately adds, this testimony is true. The importance of common grace for the literary enterprise and for the study of culture is immense. It means first that we do not need to inquire into the religious orthodoxy of an author before we can affirm what is worthy in what such an author has produced. Whenever we find the true, the good, and the beautiful, we can applaud it. This is far from universally accepted by Christians. Among earnest believers, I sometimes sense an uneasiness, if not outright hostility, toward works of literature authored by non-Christians. The lineage of this uneasiness goes all the way back to some of the church fathers who struggled with the question of how to reconcile their Christian faith with their upbringing in classical culture. Some of them rejected classical culture. The doctrine of common grace also leads us to conclude that we can and should spend time reading secular literature as well as avowedly Christian literature for our edification and delight. Of course, one cannot make adequate Christian sense of classical pagan texts without having a well-thought-out understanding of mythology. My own position is as follows. I will begin with a fact of literary history. The oldest literature of the world is myth, stories about the gods, about heroes, about marvelous events. The history of literature has been in the direction of displacement toward greater and greater realism, with romance serving as a midway step in this development. The mythical literature that arose from primitive societies reflects their religious outlook. Many of the old myths were originally believed to express religious truth, though the exact degree to which this was true is hard to determine at this late date. We know from Plato's Republic that he was appalled at Homer's portrayal of the gods. But no matter how frivolous the behavior of the gods in Homer might strike us, let us note an important way in which this mythical literature stands as a corrective to our own secular age. C.S. Lewis makes the common sense observation that, quote, the big division of humanity is into the majority who believe in some kind of God or gods and the minority who do not, still quoting. On this point, Christianity lines up with the majority, lines up with ancient Greeks and Romans, modern savages, etc., against the modern Western European materialists. The supernaturalism of mythical literature, therefore, in my view, far from being a mark against it, is part of its truthfulness. In its acceptance of the premise that there is a level of supernatural reality, it is more truthful than contemporary television programs, for example, which presumably raise no objections from Christians who dislike myth because its supernaturalism is not the Christian supernatural. Some Christians act as if the pagan gods do not exist, but this is not how the Bible views the matter. Psalm 82 tells us God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? The Israelites asked following the Red Sea deliverance. God, quote, is to be feared above all gods, the psalmist declares. These statements will make a great deal more sense to us if we know something about the other gods as we find them depicted in myth. The superiority of the God of the Bible to the gods of pagan myth is open for any reader to experience, and it is not a waste of time to experience it. I'm reminded of uh, a religious writer who says that contrary to the modern viewpoint, Atheism is a puny adversary in the eyes of the biblical writers. <clears throat> Atheism, a puny adversary. This brings us to the issue of mythical parallels or analogs to stories in the Bible. Genesis 2 is the Bible's version of life in paradise. 
Homer gives us his version of an earthly paradise. He also gives us his picture of the, heaven, of the heavenly abode of the gods and of the afterlife. In pagan mythology, more generally, we find stories of creation, a fall from innocence, a flood, a dying and reborn god, and so forth. What should be our attitude toward these stories? Christians through the centuries have disagreed in their answer to that question. The balanced middle position is well summed up by the Renaissance historian Walter Raleigh, who claimed that the old myths are, quote, crooked images of some one true history. Crooked images of some one true history. In other words, the correct version of the stories is found in the Bible. How then should we regard the crooked images of the truth, humankind's memories of a universal story, unaided by supernatural revelation? Some Christians have asserted strongly that mythology is not only false, it is evil. Kelvin Linton wrote, Satan has from the dawn of history prepared in anticipation of God's unfolding plan a great fraud, an intricate imitation of the kingdom of Christ. C.S. Lewis takes a more positive view. He speaks of how God sent the human race good dreams, that is, anticipations or echoes of the truth. Elsewhere, Lewis comments that the resemblance between these myths and the Christian truth is no more accidental than the resemblance between the sun and the sun's reflection in a pond, or that between a historical fact and the somewhat garbled version of it which lives in popular report. This strikes me as a defensible view of the old myths, and I would relate it to the theory of G.K. Chesterton that mythology is an attempt to arrive at religious truth through the imagination alone. The old myths express the right human longings, said Chesterton, longings that we share. But the answers they gave to the great issues lacked certainty. Mythical literature satisfies, says Chesterton, some of the same needs that are satisfied by religion, but it does not provide a creed that people believe with the same certainty that Christians believe the Apostles' Creed. The pagan, quote, feels the presence of powers about which he guesses and invents. In a word, writes Chesterton, mythology is a search. It expresses a need, but does not satisfy it. The pagans, quote, had dreams about realities. In agreeing with Chesterton, I'm taking issue with a long-standing Christian tradition that believes that the gods that pagans worshipped were really demons. I think that Zeus and Athena and Poseidon were figments of the pagans' imagination. It is always possible, of course, that a person might be satisfied with the dream, though no one today is in danger of converting to Greek paganism as a result of reading the Odyssey. It is more likely that a person will find the dream directing him or her to the reality. Someone has claimed that it is frequently out of a pagan soul that the best Christian soul is made. Missionary Rachel Saint, when asked how she felt about the charge that missionaries deprive natives of their culture, responded, I have come to the conclusion that we are actually giving the Indians back that which they lost maybe hundreds of years ago. In the stories of the Indians, they recognize one God. They do not know his son nor his name. We are simply taking them back to their old, old stories and filling in the facts of the gospel. The more I study their legends, the more I find of their longing to know God. I have raised the question of the religious dimension of myth because it is an issue raised in some Christian circles. I myself read myth simply as a branch of fantasy without regarding it as primarily a religious statement. After all, as Northrop Fry observes, when a system of myths loses all connection with belief, it becomes purely literary. Thus far I have presented a positive picture regarding Homer's Odyssey, as I am as well when I teach Oedipus Rex and Antigone. Where am I critical of Homer's Odyssey? I tell my students that its system of virtues and values is enlightened, but its religious vision is impossible. Not that Homer is irreligious. One cannot escape noticing the prominence of the gods in the Odyssey and the numerous ways in which the story enjoins people rever to reverence and obey the gods. In my guide to the Odyssey in the series that I'm in the process of producing, I quote a critic who claims that there is a theological dimension to Homer's epics. I agree. However, not all theology is Christian theology, and Homer's worldview is emphatically not Christian. 
As I tell my students, there's a big difference between Homer's gods, plural, and the Christian god, singular. The gap between polytheism and monotheism is unbridgeable. As I already noted, Plato was appalled by Homer's portrayal of the gods, thinking that it was unbecoming of the idea of deity. Who can doubt it? The gods of Greek mythology are amplified humans, except for their superior power and their immortality. Humans in the Greek stories reverence the gods out of enlightened self-interest. They fear the gods, and they hope that the gods will assist them as good luck charms. But people in Greek literature do not love the gods or generally relate to them personally. I would say that the relationship between Athena and Odysseus is a partial exception. What we find congenial in classical literature lies largely on the moral plane rather than the religious or spiritual. Let me at this point bring in a few frameworks that I encountered right at the start of my teaching career and that I immediately adopted in my teaching. One is a distinction that C.S. Lewis makes between the virtues that a work embodies and its values. A distinction between virtues and values. I need to quote the broader context for that distinction, which Lewis tosses in almost gratuitously and by the way. Lewis provides a brief list of, quote, the principal values actually implicit in European literature. Lewis then claims that this list represents a storehouse of the best sub-Christian values. He catalogs the values that have dominated in successive cultural periods. He says it's a storehouse of the best sub-Christian values. In a later letter to an editor responding to scholars who had interacted with his essay, Lewis slightly modified that by saying that, quote, culture is a storehouse of the best sub-Christian values, not the best sub-Christian virtues. I want to interact with that as follows. First, I do not like the formula sub-Christian. And in order to elaborate that, I need to add another framework that I've, I have used throughout my teaching career. In the classroom, I make it a practice to draw two overlapping circles on the board. I label one Christianity and the other other religious and ethical systems. I observe that there is a big overlapping area of agreement that I label inclusively Christian, meaning that it includes Christianity and other religious and ethical systems. Something is not less than Christian simply because it belongs to this middle area of agreement. Back to Lewis. I think there is an important distinction between virtues and values, and further between multiple values, multi values with a lowercase v, and the single integrating value of a worldview, value with a capital V. The moral vision of most pre-modern literature that I teach is inclusively Christian, I believe. The moral vision of most pre-modern literature that I teach is inclusively Christian. It is true that much of this literature, including the Odyssey, portrays characters who do the wrong thing. But these works usually embody a negative assessment of that wrong conduct. On the subject of values as distinct from virtues, even here I can find some common ground between the Odyssey and my Christian faith. The Odyssey offers for our approval such values as home, property, family, reverence for the gods, and justice. I can see why C.S. Lewis might call these sub-Christian inasmuch as they do not name the most important value in a Christian worldview. If I may reach back to my first year at Wheaton one more time, I was influenced by a book entitled Reading, Discussing, and Writing About the Great Books. This book described a worldview as a coherent view of life in which something is elevated to a position of supremacy in such a way that all other areas of life are defined in terms of it, a central integrating value. For a Christian, this highest value is the triune God, and the related realities of the forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven, and union with God both now and hereafter. At this point, the classical worldview obviously fails us. To elaborate that, let me take an excursion into a mini-lecture with which I conclude my study of Sophocles' two tragedies, Oedipus Rex and Antigone. I begin and end that unit by quoting 1 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 22. The Greeks seek wisdom, or knowledge, or truth, depending on your translation. But, contrast, we preach Christ crucified. The Greeks seek knowledge, but we preach Christ crucified. 
As my class and I relive Oedipus's determination to find the truth climaxed by the statement, I will hear of nothing but finding out the truth, I want my students to ponder why Paul contrasts the Greek urge for wisdom on the one hand and the gospel on the other. Then when I conclude our study of Sophocles, I say the following. Paul contrasts the Greek quest for knowledge with the Christian gospel. At first sight, this may seem surprising. After all, isn't Christianity based on knowledge and wisdom? Yes, but there is knowledge and there is knowledge. Greek wisdom, as embodied in its literature, is human knowledge only, unaided by divine revelation. It does not tell about the way of salvation through faith and the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. Tragic knowledge, specifically, tells me that I am a flawed creature who brings disaster on himself, but that knowledge is powerless to save my soul. It is bad news, and the gospel, by definition, is good news. No wonder Paul contrasts Greek wisdom to preaching Christ crucified. Let me end with a few notes on my pedagogical strategy for integration when I teach the Odyssey and the two tragedies I have named. I aggressively incorporate literary text from the Bible into the first half of my course on world literature. In my introductory unit, I have two preliminary days on the nature and function of literature, and I assign excerpts from the book of Ecclesiastes as the literary text for those two days. I follow that up with a day on narrative as a literary genre, I've just introduced students to narrative, and I use the stories of Cain, Ehud, and Genesis 3 for purposes of illustration. At approximately the halfway point through the Odyssey, I spend a day on epic-like stories from the Old Testament, requiring students to write a mini paper on the story of their choice to show their mastery of epic as a genre. On the last day that we spend on the Odyssey, I ask my students to browse around in the book of Proverbs to find a proverb that encapsulates an important aspect of Homer's Odyssey, with a view towards students reading their chosen proverb in class and explaining what it illuminates about Homer's Odyssey. After we have completed our study of the Odyssey, I assign and explicate the Old, story, uh, the Old Testament story of Ruth in class. After I finish the two tragedies by Sophocles, I ask my students to write a mini paper in which they demonstrate how the story of Samson in Judges 13 through 16 fits the pattern of a literary tragedy, and then I explicate the story in class on the day in which those papers are due. Then, for the major paper that climaxes the first half of the course, the half devoted to the classical tr tradition in literature, that includes Greek tragedy as well as the Odyssey, I ask students to write a paper that explores how classical the story of Ruth is and is not. I encourage students to take the approach that they are a Greek reader who has come across the story of Ruth for the first time and then answer the question, what would a Greek reader find familiar and unfamiliar in the story of Ruth? The very fact that I commend it leads my students to avoid it like the plague, but it's a good strategy nonetheless. <clears throat> what would a Greek reader find familiar and unfamiliar? Uh, in my in-class instructions to the class, supplemental to a handout explaining the ground rules, I end by saying the following. A main point that will surely enter your awareness as you conceptualize and compose your paper on the story of Ruth is a feeling of surprise that the apparent strangeness of Greek literature, with its pantheon of gods made in the image of man, is, once we get beyond that aberration, really quite similar to what we find in the Bible. There is, good reason, there is no good reason to suppress the common bonds between Greek and biblical literature I tell my students. In fact, we have a good theological foundation for not being threatened by this, including the descent of the whole human race from a single source, the creation of all people in the image of God, and God's common grace that endows all people with some capacity, and often a major capacity, to know the true, the good, and the beautiful. I have two purposes for intermingling biblical text with classical text as aggressively as I do. One is to plant the idea in my students' minds that much of the Bible is no less literary and artistically accomplished than the best literature to be found outside the Bible. Secondly, the intermingling of classical and biblical text accomplishes the task of integration in a natural way. I have always felt that integration works best if we can compare a text from world literature or English or American literature to an example of the same literary genre in the Bible. 
That's what I have to say about teaching a classical text. Thank you.